research is about, um, or, or where it began, was uh, uh, an impasse that I think is maybe quite familiar to uh, a lot of you, which is basically, on the one hand, there seems to be this uh, growing urgency or sense of urgency around ecological crises. So you go to the supermarket, you see all these different products that are telling you to buy green things, you know, that are sustainable and so on. On the other hand, you have uh, uh, governments, these big conferences that are going on in places like Durban about uh, climate change, uh, uh, resource scarcity, things like that. You have these big blockbuster films that are coming out in Hollywood about the end of the world and so on. So everywhere there's this kind of saturation of this idea that the world is going to come to an end and ecological catastrophe and so on. But then on the other hand, nothing really seems to be changing very much. There doesn't seem to be any radical transformations. Um, as Ulrich Beck, the sociologist, says, there's no storming of the Bastille. Um, and it's basically that impasse, that, that, that lack of any radical change that drew me into my research. So my research uh, focuses on the fisheries. And the reason I chose the fisheries is it seems to be quite a, a kind of classical, if, if that's the appropriate use of that word, uh, example of an ecological crisis. There's this resource scarcity caused by a particular mode of production, uh, industrialized fishing over the past 50 years, technological advances that has uh, depleted this fish resource um, to the extent that now in European waters there's maybe 81% of fish are classified as, as overfished, unsustainable. So the problem that is, is faced by, by government, by the EU, by the Irish government, by the fishing industry is how to move from this unsustainable mode of fishing to a sustainable mode of fishing. And this kind of uh, a, a shift or narrative is e understood as ecological modernization, how we, how we, we go from one model to another. Um, so I was interested in how that was playing out, how it was being articulated, what kind of you know, changes were being brought in um, uh, into the fisheries. So what I, I, I discovered initially in this initial kind of critical examination of the question of, uh, of sustainability in the fisheries was that it was framed in terms of how do we preserve the fish stocks. That's the initial question that everyone agrees on, everyone is supposed to agree on anyway. How do we preserve uh, 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 the productivity of fish stocks. That seems pretty benign, pretty unquestionable kind of starting point. But what that, that has led to then, that's the kind of center point of the upcoming reform of common fisheries policy uh, in 2012. It's also the, um, uh, 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 one of the main points of the integrated maritime policy, which was launched in 2008. And so the idea is that by 2015 there'll be sustainable fish stocks. What that means is that there'll be, it's, it's like a biological indicator, that there'll be a maximum sustainable productivity of fish, so they reproduce every year. But that, that, that question, or that way of framing it, gives rise to a whole set of different relations. Um, so to begin with, in terms of the fishing industry, it leads to uh, uh, much harder pressures on the fishery, much stronger regulations, much stronger policing, much, much stronger control over the, 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 the marine environment in which they operate. Um, so in, in Ireland, for example, fishermen were criminalised in 2006. Um, so if they, over, if, if they catch over their quota, they can get a prison sentence, which is, which is a big shift from it simply just being an administrative uh, fine or, or whatever. But the second uh, uh, shift, which is what I'm going to concentrate a little bit on, which I think is interesting, is that fishermen are articulated more and more as stewards of the sea, as people who have this active uh, uh, role to play in managing their environment. So they're no longer just subjects of regulation from above, from, from the government, from EU level, and they're no longer just subjects of scientific knowledge, um, because that's understood as to, to be one of the actual causes of the problem, that, that fishermen don't uh, accept scientific claims, that science, which had a claim on sort of truth or some kind of objective portrayal of nature, uh, fishermen don't accept that uh, because they might have different knowledge or, or whatever. But now what's, what's happening, and this, this comes from talking to scientists who are involved in management, but also fisheries policy, is that um, scientists are now just one, one voice at the table. This is how it's expressed. So rather than scientists coming in and saying, you have to do this and you have to listen to us, there's this sense in which uh, governance is devolving to local levels. So scientists will go to a specific area, a specific fishing community, talk to fishermen, talk to other stakeholders about how best to preserve that particular fish stock. And this is supposed to be much more productive, much more inclusive, much more democratic. Um, and interestingly, it, it in a sense demonstrates quite a lot of the critiques of science that came out of the 1990s. People like Bruno Latour kind of moved towards this idea of how science should play a role in the world, not 
not imposing a truth, but being one form of knowledge, one form of, of, of understanding the world, working with, with other people. Um, but, but the thing is that what still frames that, that whole discussion, that whole idea of a consensus around the fisheries, is that we have to preserve it. There's still this external uh, idea of nature, and this external nature is still a single thing. It's something that applies to everybody. It, just because fishermen can take a part in, in preserving that, it doesn't mean that this, this idea of a single nature hasn't been questioned. So the, moving to the second part of my research, what, what I looked at and, 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 and what was referred to in the introduction was I, I did uh, ethnography. I worked in fishing boats for about a year and a half. I lived in a fishing community, commercial fishing co communities, big boats. And going out on the fishing boats and talking to fishermen, you get this, this very strong impression that they don't think about the marine environment as something to know. They don't think of it as something external that they can verify in any way. It's not something that's static or kind of objective. So, this, which is odd because fishermen rely on, on the sea to, to catch fish. They rely on a kind of certainty. They want to catch more fish. But that doesn't lead to the same sort of logic of wanting to know exactly why the lobsters move like this, what their biological habits are, how we can, we can sort of know it as something, as an object. Um, and, and, and it's interesting because you're out with a fisherman and I've fished for 30 years and there's no fish in his net or there's no lobsters in his pot. And the reaction very often is just a shrugging of your shoulders. You know, it's just, it just happens. We don't know why that happens. It's just something that happens. And what, what I'm suggesting is that, that that experience of knowledge or experience of nature or the natural world is much much more different, or, or, or very different, to the idea of some single of nature that remains unchanging, something that we can preserve, manage, administer, control. It's something that, it's, it's an idea of nature that kind of unfolds through activity. So when you're out in a fishing boat, there, there, there might be waves, there might be wind, the nets might be moving around, there's fish swimming, and that kind of creates a, a kind of assemblage of humans, non-humans, technology, animals, but it's not fixed. The, the different components all, all, all act differently within that kind of context. So this idea of nature unfolding s suggests the idea that nature can be many different things, that it's not something single that we can possibly preserve. And I think what's interesting is that it, it kind of relates a little bit to ideas of sort of cosmologies of old, you know, cosmologies of like before the Enlightenment. Uh, if we think of Native Americans, for example. When they're asked about the environment or the natural world, they don't think about it in terms of something that they have to care or, or, or for or preserve or look after. The, 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 the world in which they operate changes. So if there's a, a bear, if the bear's attacking them, then that's, that's what it's doing. If, it, if they need to get fur, then they're getting fur from the bear. If the bear's, ca a bear's catching fish, the bear's catching fish over there. It, it constantly changes. It's not one thing. It depends on the relationship that is, is happening in that particular moment. And so just to, 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 to finish, the, the, the position that I'm moving in in my research is the idea that a, a kind of a, a, a politics of sustainability should be more of, should be less about asking the question how do we preserve it whatever it is, and it should be more about how do we generate, develop, and foster different natures, many different natures. And for me, that's the the, the kind of exciting um, further direction of, of, of my research. So thank you very much. You've been applying this kind of discussion, methodology, and conceptual work to uh, uh, fishing and, 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 and fish stocks. Mm -hmm. But could you, could you elaborate on what it would be to apply this type of methodology on, for instance, something like climate, where there is, we are part of it, mm -hmm. whether we like it or not. So did, did, you, did you have any comment well, on that? I think that maybe, maybe one way of understanding it is that, say we're climate change, Climate change, it, 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 it almost it begins from a it begins from a, a universal. I mean, what is climate change? It's this abstract thing that then manifests itself in lots of sort of small technologies and and, and, and small sort of measures, regulations, which then affect experience. And I, I think that the reverse. When I think about the idea of, of many different natures, I think that rather than sort of you know beginning from the position of a totality and regulating down. The idea of many natures emerging from actual experience of humans and non-humans generating different forms of collective, I think that, that's, that that begins from something particular, something quite grounded and concrete, and that maybe that then can, can generate up. Um, and I think that, that that would be how I'd approach the question of climate change. Because I think climate change is a really interesting...
I mean, it, it's the example of what I'm suggesting here about how a single, single idea of, of, of nature or sustainability or whatever becomes this discursive, this rationality that, that starts to, you know, create controls, technologies and so on that manifest themselves in people's individual lives. Um, yeah.